Welcome to this IEA webinar. My name is Beatriz Martinez and today I will be introducing you to some of our work on call statistics. I am the responsible for the production of the call information publication, an annual publication that provides statistics on call markets. We will start with an introduction to see the relevance of coal in the energy mix and a bit of background. Far from disappearing, coal is the second largest source of primary energy in 2015. The world continues to rely on coal and this is especially true for the fast industrializing economies of Asia, where coal is an essential energy source for the economic growth. The contribution of coal to the global TPS in 2015 was around 28%. Despite the fact that coal is one of the most polluting ways to generate electricity, and some regions have been trying in recent years to phase it out, simultaneous industrialization in other parts of the world has counterbalanced the efforts. The world counts on coal for stable and affordable power generation with a global share of 39% in 2015, being coal the largest source of electricity generation. Recognizing the importance of coal for key economies is essential. China is a remarkable example of the role that coal plays in the economic development. Coal is deeply integrated into the China's economic development and China is by far the largest consumer and producer in the world. The energy mix in India has developed significantly since 2000. Thanks to industrialization and the attempt to secure reliable, adequate and affordable supply of electricity, coal became the key source for its generation. Coal is important at many levels. We have seen it is a reliable and an affordable source of energy in many countries. It is responsible for about 40% of the electricity generated in the world. 73% of the total electricity and heat generated in China comes from coal, and 75% in the case of India. Aside from electricity generation, coal has other important uses worldwide, where the steel production and cement manufacturing are the most important ones. Why is that? Why is coal that widely used? Coal is cheap and simple to extract, ship and burn. Coal is abundant. There are about 1 trillion tons of proven reserves widely distributed around the world. And those are the reasons why coal accounts for around 28% of the total primary energy supply in 2015. It has environmental concerns as coal is the main energy contributor to CO2 emissions and also because of the air pollution concerns. There is also a potential for development and deployment of clean coal technologies such as carbon capture and storage. Now I would like to briefly give you a comprehensive statistical picture of the current market trends in the world coal sector, including 2016 provisional data. Looking at global figures, world coal production declined in 2016 by around 458 million tons, which is the largest decline in absolute terms since 1971. This decline was the result of a multitude of factors, among which the setting quotas for mine operating days in the People's Republic of China was the most important one. Production of all coal types, which means steam coal, coking coal and lignite, fell in 2016. Conversely, international trade increased in 2016 as imports grew by 1.5%. The People's Republic of China increased imports by 25%, while Indian imports decreased by 7.2%. Despite the decline of Indian imports, the People's Republic of China and India were in 2016 both the two largest producers and importers. India's coal consumption increased by 2.1% in 2016, continuing 18 years of constant growth, while consumption in the People's Republic of China declined by 1.8% in 2016 and 7.8% in the United States. Our latest coal statistics so that China still consumes half the world's coal despite leveling off in the past few years. The information presented in the previous slides is the output of coal data collection. To allow data collection, it is essential to know the different coal types and classification, and some basic concepts that I would like to show you. There are many types of coal and firstly we need to distinguish between primary coals and derived coal products, which are those derived of transformation processes. Primary coal is a fossil fuel, usually with the physical appearance of a rock, consisting of carbonized vegetal matter. In this category, we will include anthracite, coking coal, other bituminous coal, subbituminous coal, lignite, peat and oil shale. 
Derived fuels include both solid fuels and gases produced during coal processing and by coal transformation. These include patent fuels, briquettes, cocoa and coke, coal tar and pit products, as well as manufactured gases. But primary coal can be also distinguished by their physical and chemical characteristics. These characteristics determine the coal's price and suitability for various uses. The higher the carbon content of a coal, the higher its quality. Higher rank coals have lower levels of moisture and volatile matter, better cooking qualities and therefore higher price. Hard coal refers to coal of gross calorific value greater than around 25,000 kilojoules per kilogram and it includes anthracite, cooking coal and other bituminous coal. Brown coal refers to coal with a gross calorific value less than around 18,000 kilojoules per kilogram. Because coal is classified in many different ways, there is often confusion in the classification of primary coals, particularly as regard to brown coal and subituminous coal. Subituminous coal is a category that overlaps the boundary between hard coal and brown coal. Generally, subituminous coal with energy content about 18,600 kilojoules per kilogram can be considered as hard coal, while those below are considered brown coal. But coal is not classified only based on physical properties, but can be also classified based on how it's used. In this classification, coking coal is also known as metallurgical coal. That is to say, coal of a sufficient grade for being used for steel production. Steam coal, also known as thermal coal, is suitable for electric power production. This group includes anthracite, other bituminous coal and subituminous coal. Lignite is usually excluded of this classification. Once we know the different types of coal and classifications, and in order to have a clear view of the coal market from production to consumption, let me show you a simplified flowchart of the supply chain. Production, trade and stocks are the main elements of the supply side. Most primary coal production occurs either in underground mines or in surface mines. Some production can also come from recovery of coal from waste piles and other sources. With regard to trade, Coal is a product that is easily transported over long distances, either by boat or by train. Because of the significant levels of coal trade, it is important for a country not only to know how much coal is imported and exported, but also to know the origin and the destination. Concerning stocks, timely detail and accurate data on the changes in coal stocks are essential for policy makers and market analysis. On the other side, the consumption of coal occurs in several sectors. In the transformation sector, by the energy industry within the energy sector and in the various sectors of final consumption, industry, residential, etc., including both energy and non-energy use of the fuels. Let's have a look in more detail at the transformation and energy sector. There is a wide variety of transformation plants which are used to derive energy products from coal. These energy plants include electricity and heat plants, where the input is coal such as anthracite and other bituminous coal that is transformed into electricity, heat or both of them. Coke ovens, whose main input is coking coal that will be transformed into coke oven coke and other byproducts, such as coke oven gas and coal tar. Blast furnaces, where the coke oven coke producing coke ovens can be used later on to make steel, obtaining coal manufactured gases as secondary products. Gas works, which are utilities whose main purpose is manufacture, transport and distribution of gas and where gas or gas is produced. And finally, coal liquefaction plants, where coal is converted into liquid hydrocarbons. So far, we have talked about transformation and I want to show you a practical example of coke ovens. What happens in a coke oven is basically a process of carbonization, where the coal is heated at a high temperature in an oxygen-free atmosphere. Only certain type of coal can be converted to coke. This is coking coal, which is the input of this transformation process. The coking coal is therefore transformed into another coal product, uh, coal, coke oven coke. In this process, some byproducts are also released, such as coke oven gas and coal tar. Therefore, fuels transformed into another energy form should be always reported in the transformation sector. Now, we imagine that a portion of the, releases, uh, of the released gases are burned to heat the coke oven. In this case, Fuels that are consumed to give support to the operation of the energy sector should be considered as energy industry on use. Data collection differs and depends on whether a country is an OECD member or not. 
For OECD countries, national administrations provide data to the IEA using the joint IEA Eurostat UNEC questionnaires. It is compulsory for administrations to provide data to the IEA because of their membership to the organization. For non-OECD countries, there is no formal obligation on administrations to submit data and most are based on memorandum of understanding. Call companies and data publications are also consulted. The coal questionnaire covers all solid fossil fuels and the manufactured gases. It consists of four tables and 17 products, seven of them primary products and 10 derived products. Table 1 is the main table where all the flows of the supply and consumption side must be reported. This is, this is in close correlation with Table 4, where all the calorific values for the figures reported in Table 1 must be reported. Tables 2 and 3 refer to the origin of the imports and the destination of the exports. In this slide, the relationship between the tables of the questionnaire is illustrated. It is essential that the figures reported in each table are correctly totaled and that the totals in different tables are consistent. For instance, within the call questionnaire, the total imports reported in the table 2, which is the sum of imports from all origins, should match the total figure of imports reported in table 1. The same would apply to exports. There are not only logical relationships between the different tables of a questionnaire, but also inter-questionnaire relationships. For, ex for example, if a certain quantity of coal is consumed for electricity generation, this should be reported in both questionnaires, coal and electricity, and the figures need to be consistent. Let's have a look in more detail at the individual tables. As mentioned before, the table 1 is where all the flows of the supply and consumption side must be reported. Now I'm going to show you an example on how to report coal data in this table. Let's imagine that in our country, 78 kilotons of anthracite were produced. 2,096 kilotons of lignite were used in power plants to generate electricity. And finally, 100 kilotons of cocoa and coke were consumed to make steel. As you see, we have three different elements, quantity, product, and flow. To report this data, we need to find the flow in the rows of the table, and in columns, we find the product, and we report the quantity in the corresponding cell. Tables 2 and 3 concern imports of coal by ultimate origin, the country in which the coal was produced, for use in the country, and exports of coal produced to the ultimate country of consumption. The reason why we collect imports by origin and exports by destination is that quality of coal and coal products can differ by country, region, and mine. Applying the same logic of the first table, if we want to report 10 kilotons of cooking coal imported <coughs> from Albania, we will need to report the quantity in the corresponding product and flow. As the calorific values of the different flows may vary, we need to collect calorific values for all the different flows, and that is the purpose of table 4. It is also important that these calorific values are properly balanced, as if they are not, a statistical difference will show up when converting in energy units. In other words, besides the physical quantities of the supply and the demand side which should match, the energy content should match too. To ensure this, the calorific values reported must lead to the same energy content for, for both sides. Once again, we need to identify the product, the flow and the calorific values in our table 4 and report it accordingly. After collecting the data through the different tables, the data needs to pass through a data quality control which will include arithmetical checks, where we should look at the sums, totals, signs, and we also check the consistency between the tables in a questionnaire and between different questionnaires. There are also statistical checks, where special attention should be paid to statistical difference and the consistency of the time series. Among the physical checks, it is essential to check the calorific values the comparison between the physical and energy balances, and the transformation efficiencies. And finally, we compare with secondary sources and partner sources, and we make sure that the data are complete and tell us the correct story. As we have seen, data collection and validation is not easy, but it's vital for making sound policy and business decisions. Collecting any statistics has a cost, a balance between the efficient use of resources and collecting what is necessary must be struck. What is necessary will depend on the needs of the data users, 
However, not all needs will be possible to meet. It is important to look at the changes in the energy sector and to limit the collecting to the most important fields. We need to know that, despite the cost, a lack of quality data could ultimately be far more costly than data collection. In view of the role and importance of energy in world development, one would expect basic energy information to be available and reliable. This is not always the case and there are several reasons behind the decline of quality in energy statistics. The liberalization of the, mar of the energy markets, for instance, has had a double impact on statistics. First, while in the past we could obtain detailed information from a single national utility company, now hundreds of surveys from the companies are requested to have a comprehensive view of the sector. Secondly, a competitive market often leads to confidentiality issues. On top of this, we add to the challenges the lack of resources and the fast turnover in the staff. The objective of a collection system is to have detailed and reliable data on the different parts of the production and consumption chain and to facilitate it, we need to have a legal basis, a proper reporting mechanism, a proper dissemination mechanism, and we need to allocate proper resources to collect and process the data and review methodology and process to anticipate and adapt to change in the energy situation. Here, I want to go through each data collection methods with simple examples. Surveys. Countries can collect data directly from energy suppliers or end users. For example, National Energy Ministry or a Statistics Office can ask electricity suppliers to fill a questionnaire which have the information on how much they generated or supplied electricity. Through the survey, countries could get relatively accurate data, but sometimes it can cost too much. In that case, administration data can be the second option. Administration data is the data collected for administrative purposes. It may be held by the government or by a public or private company and it can lower the survey burden. But it has dependency on third parties, so cooperation is needed among policymakers, administrations and statisticians. There are some variables that should be measured rather than surveyed. For instance, energy consumption data collected by smart meters, which can give us very timely information. And if there is no data available, data should be estimated. For example, if a country does not have available the blast furnace gas production, this can be estimated based on the pre iron production, as these two values are strongly correlated. We are approaching the end of this presentation and we have talked about the current market in the world coal sector, about coal data collection, about coal data validation and now I would like to talk about the uses of data. The data collected by the IEA are used in a multitude of ways. Outside of the IEA, the data is used globally by governments, academics, researchers, analysts, investors and other associations. The data is used in various ways, to assess the security of supply, to compare the performance of different countries, to assess how effective the policies are, and mostly to make sound policy and business decisions. Here I want to show you some of the IEA publications. The foremost use of coal statistics data is in the coal information book and the associated databases. But coal data is also used to calculate the energy balances, CO2 emissions, as well as energy efficiency indicators. The data are also used within the IEA to conduct analysis and develop forecasts. And they are also used to produce the World Energy Outlook, one of the main publications of the IEA. Thank you for listening to me so far. If you want to learn more about the IEA energy statistics, we have a lot of different resources that can be helpful. You will find below the links for our energy statistics manual, which is a comprehensive manual available in 10 languages. You can also visit the IEA statistics website for a wealth of resources, including our questionnaires, glossary and documentation related to our data collection methodologies. Also, you can have a look at the United Nations International Recommendations for Energy Statistics, which provide a methodological framework.